for a few minutes, and I think we'll be off and running around 7.08 or 7.10 or something like that. So, uh, um, 7.10. Sounds good. Okay, yep. So just, just hang tight, and thank you again for joining us, and we, we look forward to it. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight... I was not only distressed, I was disgusted. Special coverage of last night's debate kicking it off with Newt Minow from the Presidential Debate Commission. This guy will close down the whole country. And Plus, our diverse country. community perspectives on last night's event. It is uh, difficult for some populations to complete the census. Filling out a census form is more nuanced than it may seem. We talk to the experts about what's at stake. We know that ensuring safety is more than a law enforcement effort. Reaction to Mayor Lightfoot's new violence reduction plan. Speaker Madigan abused his office. Speaker Madigan abused the public trust. A fiery hearing on corruption in Springfield. That plus more on the presidential debate in tonight's edition of Spotlight Politics. I feel like a lot of people come to Chicago and they don't realize that there's anything further south than Hyde Park. And how a south side community is working to showcase the artists in their neighborhood. But first, some of today's top stories. Early voting in what has already proven to be a historic presidential election begins tomorrow for Chicagoans. We have shattered the previous record for vote, vote by mail applications. We currently have over 441,000 vote by mail applications. This is truly unprecedented. The Chicago Board of Elections says it's also received a record number of judging applications. Voters are encouraged to cast their ballots before Election Day on November 3rd. But if voters choose to vote in person, the board says precautions are in place, including strict social distancing, masks, hand sanitizers, and plexiglass dividers. Voting opens at the city's Loop Super Site tomorrow and at 50 early voting locations around the city on October 14th. And there's more of this story on our website. Neighbors in Rockford, Dixon and Galena will be facing stricter coronavirus restrictions starting this Saturday since those cities are in the state's Region 1, which has surpassed an 8% positivity rate. The governor and Illinois Department of Public Health director appeared in a virtual press conference today they're all quarantining after a member of Pritzker's staff tested positive for the coronavirus earlier this week. Concerning uptick in positivity, jumping more than two percentage points in two weeks demands increased focus on stopping the spread. In the past week, Region 1 also has had an early indication of increasing hospital admissions for COVID-like illness. Additionally, the state confirmed more than 2,200 new cases of the virus and 35 additional deaths. The state's total case count is now more than 293,000 cases and more than 8,600 people have died from the illness. 
The Cubs playoff series against Miami gets off to a rough start. The Cubs failed to score here in the third inning with two men on with two outs when designated hitter Victor Caratini grounded out to end the inning. The Marlins cruise to a 5-1 victory at Wrigley Field to take game one in the best of three series. Game two is tomorrow. The Sox didn't fare much better in Oakland. Former White Sox infielder Marcus Simeon came back to haunt his old team with this two-run homer in the second off of Sox starter Dallas Keuchel. Despite a furious ninth inning rally, the A's went on to win by a final of 5-3, to three, nodding the series up at one game apiece with a deciding game three tomorrow. And now to begin our special coverage of the presidential debates, we go to Carol Maureen and a member of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Carol. Brandis, interruption, disruption, insults. It was arguably the most disturbing, unruly presidential debate ever produced. Chicago's Newton Minow is the father of presidential debates. He first proposed the idea back in 1955. To this day, he serves on the Commission on Presidential Debates. We'll get his reaction and the Commission's response to last night's chaotic event. But first, here's just a small sample of what 65 million television viewers saw and heard. It's all true, and here's the deal. He's talking about the Green he, New Deal, and it's not two billion I'm, or twenty billion, as you said. I'm it's one hundred trillion dollars. I'm talking about where they the want to rip down plan. buildings no, no, uh, and rebuild the building. No, it's the dumbest, not, most ridiculous. Not, where airplanes are out of business, a, a, where two car systems are out, where they want true. to take out the cows too. Not you know that's true. not true either, right? Not this true. is a this is a one hundred trillion. Look, that's more money than our is, country could make. In a hundred years, if we're not going the case. All right, let me, let me, let me, let me, because, because I actually, wait a minute, sir. Newton Minow joins us now. He's an attorney, a member of the board of the Commission on Presidential Debates, former chairman of the FCC under President John F. Kennedy, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and we should note, a member emeritus of the WTTW board. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Carol, and it's great to be with you. You'll forgive me that I'll call you Newt, but we've known each other a really long time, and I don't quite know how to say Mr. Minow. So, Newt, is it fair to say you were deeply distressed by last night's debate? I was not only distressed, I was disgusted, because our purpose in having the debates is to serve the viewer, to give the viewer some valuable information before the viewer votes. And instead, we got a wrestling match. Do we lay the failure to control this debate at the feet of the moderator, Chris Wallace? No, I thought Chris did very well. I think he tried his best. He had very good questions. Uh, but it, the problem was that the candidates did not follow the rules, which they themselves had agreed to. Can you ever have foreseen a time when two presidential candidates, one a former vice president himself, the other the incumbent, would call each other not smart, weak, or a clown? No, I've been involved, I was trying to count exactly, it's around 40 debates, starting in 1960 with Kennedy Nixon, with the League of Women Voters in 76 and 80 and 84, with the Commission on Presidential Debates ever since. This is the first time that the candidates have not obeyed the rules and have made this uh, opportunity to educate and serve the voters to turn it into a really a, a, a totally disgusting performance in the exercise of the democratic process. I know your phone was ringing off the hook this morning, and I know you've been in conference calls with the commission. CBS News' Nora O'Donnell is tweeting out that you and the commission are considering the possibility in debates going forward of having a mute button where the moderator can <laughs> stop the interruption. Can you confirm that? Yes, uh, we're considering everything. Uh, we know that what happened last night uh, did not serve the voter well. And that's our purpose. It's not our purpose to serve the candidates, it's to serve the voter. Totally nonpartisan. And we were figuring out every alternative way 
to make sure that that purpose is well served. It, uh, on, last night was unfortunate. Over the history of the debates, they've been very valuable. You get to see both candidates or more, more candidates uh, in live television with no commercials, with they have to think on their feet and deal with the situation. You get a chance to evaluate their ability, their intellect, their personality, their character. And last night was a strong, sad departure from the history of the presidential debates. You, you know, you can make rules. As Chris Wallace pointed out, the candidates agreed to the rules. Mr. Trump's team agreed to the rules. But if the candidates do not follow the rules, what is there left to do exactly? Well, there's no point in rules without their being observed. And what we'll have to do is find some way to take a candidate who doesn't obey the rules to not let the, not let the candidate repeat that. And that's what we're working on, and I'm sure we'll succeed. Next week, uh, a week from today, is going to be the vice presidential debate which will be a town hall debate where citizens are asked questions and I'm sure there'll be time limits and I don't think we'll have anything like what happened last night. Yeah, but then the third debate is going to be back to Biden and Trump. And I have to ask, are we at a point where social norms are no longer really observant of civil discourse and there's now no point in doing these debates where almost anything goes? Well, I think we have to go on with the debates and we have to insist that civil discourse is restored as it should be. And uh, if, if we find that candidates don't want to observe the rules, uh, we'll find another way to serve the voter. We're not going to give up because we feel that our purpose is a very valuable purpose in, the, in a democracy, and that is to give the voter the information uh, about their choice. And uh, that, that's essential in, in a democracy. But tell me the truth. Last night, as you and Joe sat there to watch it, was there a temptation at some point or another just to turn it off? Because I suspect a number of Americans did that. Carol was a temptation to scream because uh, it was, I, I've never seen it, anything like it. I've been around a long time. You have been around a long time and may you be around a lot longer. Newton Minow, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. We look forward to seeing what new rules, all of them, the commission will put in place. Thank you very much. Well, Carol, I want to say thank you. Uh, you are a most respected, loved journalist in the country, one of the, one of the very best. And what you've done here for Channel 11, what you've done for NBC, what you've done for CBS, in your career is exceptional. And your contribution here will be greatly, greatly missed. We love you, Carol. Love you right back. Thank you, Newt. And now for more on last night's debate, we go back to Paris shots. Paris? I echo Newt Minow's sentiments. Thank you, Carol. Amid the chaos and clamor of last night's debate, there was some actual policy discussed. Voters may have gotten some sort of glimpse into both candidates' positions on COVID mitigation, health care coverage, the economy, and voting rights, but a lot of it was overshadowed when the president was asked by moderator Chris Wallace to denounce white supremacist domestic terror groups like the Proud Boys. Here's that exchange. Almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what are you, what are you, you look, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right. Who would you like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and right proud proud boys. Boys, Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right his wing own, problem. His this own is a FBI left wing. Direct and joining us to provide their perspectives on the debate are David Rudd, Vice President of the Communications Consultancy Rudd Resources and the past president and current treasurer of the Black Public Relations Society of Chicago, 
Elliot Richardson, co-founder and president of the Small Business Advocacy Council, and Vincent Casillas, CEO of the public relations firm Casillas Strategies and the former National Hispanic Media Director for the Obama for America campaign in 2008. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. I want to get right to it. Uh, David Rudd, when you heard uh, those words, uh, stand back and stand by, instead of a condemnation of white supremacy, uh, what was your reaction? Ah. We, we've known uh, Mr. Trump to be a, a shocking, rule-breaking individual. That's his, that's his M.O. Uh, and you almost expect some sort of uh, crazy statement like that, but clearly you're shocked. And that's the only thing that I've been seeing across my social media feeds all day is that, you know, this out-of-control bull in a China shop stopped for a second to give a command to, to domestic terrorists to stand by. It's just totally shocking and totally uh, unacceptable. Mr. Casillas, uh, what went through your mind? Well, I mean, look, you know, there was a, a very clear juxtaposition yesterday. I thought you saw Joe Biden uh, attempting to, you know, speak into the camera and speak to the American people. On the other hand, you, you know, you had Donald Trump clearly speaking to his base. And, uh, you know, when, you know, he is the president of the United States and, uh, uh, you know, just bypassing the dog whistle and clearly speaking uh, to a group uh, the Proud Boys that, uh, you know, has demonstrated, you know, the ability to, you know, cause uh, racist attacks and, and do all these other things. It was just an absolute, uh, you know, sad day for presidential politics. Elliot Richardson, from a small business advocacy perspective, was there anything you heard from either candidate that gave you a sense that one or the other might have a plan to help small business right now, especially struggling with the economy? You know, small businesses are struggling to pay their rent right now. Uh, they're struggling to pay their employees. Property owners are struggling to pay their mortgages. And what we heard last night was far from anything, frankly, on either side that showed us a plan on how we were going to help businesses recover from this pandemic. And perhaps there was a plan somewhere there um, by either President Trump or Vice President Biden, but it was very difficult to get to any of that beyond the yelling and, and um, you know, just the acrimony that was part of that debate. And from a small business perspective, for, for small businesses across the state and the country, that was very disappointing. We really wanted to hear more about how we were going to get access to capital into the hands of those small businesses right now that are just struggling to stay afloat. And, of course, there are uh, uh, negotiations right now on a possible other stimulus bill, although they have not yielded any results. Amid many tense exchanges last night was this one about the president's handling of the COVID crisis. Let's take a look. This guy will close down the whole country and destroy our country. Our country is coming back incredibly well, setting records as it does it. We don't need somebody to come in and say, let's shut it down. The idea that he is insisting that we go forward and open when you have almost half the states in America with a significant increase in COVID deaths and COVID cases in the United States of America. And he wants to open it up more. Why does he want to open it up? Why doesn't he take care of the America? You can't fix the economy until you fix the COVID crisis. All right, Elliot, I'll go back to you here. It does seem to be a difference of opinion on how to get the economy back up and running. Did either candidate appeal to you on this argument? Where's the plan? You, you know, it, it's not open up right away or don't open at all. There's got to be a plan. How do you get people safely back to work? There's so many people who are unemployed, so many folks who have lost their business. And those businesses aren't going to come back, not for a long time. So was there anything that I heard uh, I didn't hear much at all about how to phase in a reopening that gets businesses back to business um, and gets people back to work. I wish I could be more optimistic about what we heard last night. And I really hope that at the next debate, the next time these folks meet, we hear a plan because small businesses need to have confidence that their politicians can help solve some of these problems. David Rudd, uh, you've heard a lot from the president about uh, the suburbs. He says that uh, Joe Biden will destroy the suburbs, something like that. Um, is that a dog whistle? Absolutely, it's a dog whistle. I think that he issued a direct command when he talked about uh, stand by and, 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 and uh, stand back. But certainly when he starts to, to, to incite fear in communities that are diverse themselves, he is sending a dog whistle that these uh, these black and brown people are coming out your way to wreak havoc, uh, to, 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 to bring danger to your communities. And that's certainly a dog whistle. We, we trust that it won't work. We trust that people will understand what they're seeing. 
and for those people who are who are uh, still thinking what they want to do, you have to listen carefully to the people who are who are re with whom he resonates. Listen carefully to the fact that that these domestic terrorists are are, are celebrating what he said last night. Listen carefully to the fact that uh, that people are thinking it's okay that uh, that we have this kind of conduct that we have someone who is speaking this way. It's really not just about Trump. It's really about what he's brought out. Uh, unfortunately, in our society. And, and this Proud Boys group did celebrate uh, the comments that uh, Trump made. To Vi Vincent Casillas, was there anything said by either candidate that would appeal to the Hispanic Latino community? Anything on immigration, anything on the economy, on COVID? You know, you know I tell people typically the, the, the average voter doesn't pay attention to presidential politics until the debate. And I can guarantee you there were a lot of Latinos and Latinas across this country who are tuning in for the first time just to get a glimpse of what was happening. And I can guarantee you most of them were disappointed. Uh, you know, there's clearly been a very disproportionate number of Latinos who have contracted COVID. Uh, but then if you tie that to the economy, you know, over the past decade, Latinos have been instrumental in, in driving the economy and being an economic engine with small businesses. But unfortunately, because of COVID, a lot of these small businesses have either had to downscale, they're hurting, or absolutely just closing altogether. And, and so if I'm a, if I'm a Latino uh, uh, you know, father or uh, a mother and I'm looking for answers, yesterday I didn't get them. And that's unfortunate because clearly these debates were designed to really give people an idea of what the platform is for each candidate. And so, you know, again, it was uh, one of those uh, debates that, you know, will go down in history as unfortunately, uh, you know, a waste of time for a lot of people. Elliot, that's unfortunate. Elliot Richards, in a few seconds we had left, have left, um, you heard the president at the end uh, talk about the election. He believes it's going to be rigged. He believes there's all kinds of fraud. How does that make business owners feel, this, this kind of talk of unrest? The whole thing makes business owners less confident, and less confident business owners are more reluctant to hire. And what we would have wanted to hear was about solutions like the Restart Act. You know, how do we make things better right now during this pandemic? And what we heard just throughout the entire debate was just more reason for small businesses to pull back and to be less likely to go out to hire to try to grow. And that's unfortunate. So it did not make us feel good. The whole debate did not make the small all right. business I'm gonna, feel good at all. I'm going to have to leave it there. Our thanks to David Rudd, Elliot Richardson, and, and Vincent Kissias. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we'll have more special coverage of the first presidential debate with our Spotlight Politics team later in the program. So make sure you stick around for that. The Trump administration had wanted tonight to be the deadline for the 2020 census. It's been extended due to a federal court decision stemming from California. But organizers in Illinois are still making a major last minute push, encouraging people to fill out their census forms now. Amanda Vinicky joins us with a rundown of what you need to know. Amanda. Chris, exactly when the census wraps up is a question nobody seems to have a clear answer to. Normally, counting would go through October, but the Trump administration is aiming to get counting completed on Monday. That's why organizers are telling folks who have not yet completed the census, either by phone, returning their form, or online, to do it now, no matter when it ends, the late start that some census workers got due to COVID-19 means the get out the census season will have been cut short. And unfortunately, this census in 2020 is going to have a big asterisk next to it because of both the extraordinary politicization of the census leading up to census day on April 1st, as well as this truncated enumeration system or season. University of Illinois demographer and census enumerator Cynthia Buckley says the U.S. could have taken a different approach. When we look globally, 2020 is a big year for censuses all across the, the globe. We are the only country that has cut down the amount of time given for a census. We didn't postpone the census to the following year, which is an option that many other countries have done. We haven't expanded census data collection, which other countries have done. 
And while filling out the census seems to be quick and simple, that is not always the case. That's according to the 2020 Census Director of the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. They can be coming from countries where um, the government trying to count you is uh, a precursor to violence. A renter also could be confused if they're to fill out the census form or is whatever they got in their mailbox for the homeowner. Answer there. The census is for everyone, for renters, for non-citizens, for refugees, for babies, anyone and everyone as of where they were living April 1st. Buckley says that Illinois does have particular challenges with getting a complete count given the state's large immigrant population. Also, the Midwest in general population is aging, and those are too tougher to count demographics. Then there's Sweet Home Chicago. We love Chicago. We benefit greatly from the wonderful city of Chicago. It is a city of big shoulders, but those shoulders can be hard to enumerate. So because we have such a major metropolitan area, undercount is always going to be a question. If you're confused about the census, Fitzsimmons says, just do it. You fill out the census, you know, even if you're not sure, am I supposed to, or somebody else supposed to, what, just fill it out. If the Census Bureau receives duplicative data, they have a process for dealing with it. So even if you're not sure, even if you're like, I think I filled it out, but I don't remember, just fill it out again. There is no, you know, giving them the information twice is not a problem. In other words, it's the opposite of voting. When it comes to the census, early and often is legal and acceptable, even encouraged. And it matters, says the Center on Halstead's Jolie Holloman. And so if we don't respond to the census, we miss a, a golden opportunity to speak for our communities. And for the LGBTQ community specifically, um, a lot of us rely upon those resources. And not just when it comes to money, it also matters for representation in Congress. Illinois is expected to lose at least one seat, possibly two. This year is the first time that the census is fully available online. Another first, those in same-sex partnerships can share that. We do have this question about partnering, but we definitely don't have gender identity questions. We don't have, um, I mean, it's, it's binary still. And then we do not have uh, sexual orientation questions. We're missing so much. Now, whatever data that the census does collect is shared collectively and used by the government and journalists such as us, but the personal information that you give, that is to be kept private just accessible by the Census Bureau and by you. You can look it up for 70 years. And Paris, back to you. All right, Amanda, a lot uh, more folks to be counted and only a little bit of time. Thank you so much. And now, Brandis, we go back to you for a dive into the mayor's new plan for public safety. Paris, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is unveiling a new public safety plan to curb in the short and long term the city's violent epidemic. The plan includes calls for additional outreach to gun and domestic violence victims, expanding housing and employment access to at-risk communities, and licensing Chicago police officers, among much more. This five-point holistic approach that is a result of more than a year's worth of collaboration with diverse leaders and community members from across the city. But as the city faces a $2 billion budget deficit thanks to COVID-19, Chicago is stopping short on just how to fund this plan. Here to talk about if the plan goes far enough are Eddie Bocanegra, Senior Director of Heartland Alliance's Ready Chicago, which works with those at risk for committing violence and connects them to jobs and services, and Vaughn Bryant, Executive Director of Metropolitan, Metropolitan Peace Initiatives. Welcome back to Chicago tonight to both of you. Thanks for joining us as always. So this plan has five pillars. They are empower and heal people, protect and secure places, improve and advance policing, affect public policy, and plan and coordinate. Eddie Bocanegra, let's start with you, please. You know, given your experience working on the ground with communities that are at risk for violence, what is your initial reaction to the mayor's plan? 
Well, I'm, I'm glad, first and foremost, that it's happening. I'm glad that after a year, uh, the city took the time that was needed to really think about a comprehensive plan that both Vaughn, myself, and so many of our allies have been a part to help co-design this. And so I think the uh, ingredients that I see today in, in, in this uh, vision are really what's needed to really make a difference in our city. Uh, Vaughn Bryant, do you think this plan goes far enough to address the s systemic issues that lead to gun violence? Well, on paper it does. I think the, the devil is in the details and it's, it's really about how we can execute. And that's up to us uh, as stakeholders in the community in this city uh, to play our part, to have a spirit of uh, collaboration and uh, endurance for the long haul to, to get to the city we want to see. So let's talk a little bit about funding. This is an ambitious plan, obviously. The, the violence that we're seeing today did not happen overnight. You know, do you think the city will actually be able to put enough money behind this plan for it to work? Uh, eventually, yes. I think, uh, you know, the reality is if you gave us $100 million today, we wouldn't be able to execute on that efficiently. So I think smart growth is important, and as long as they continue to uh, fund us in an increasing way based on the plans that we have solidly uh, laid and, and that we're prepared to execute. You know, I trust that between the city, the county, the state, and the philanthropic community that we'll, we'll get it done. So, uh, Eddie, one initiative of the plan is to prioritize funding for violence intervention and victim services, which is work that the both of you do. How much more money, you know, does, would the plan need for that specific kind of work? Well, I think that often, Brandon, we underestimate the, the needs and we underestimate the uh, acute trauma uh, that many of the folks that we try to work with actually encounter. Uh, we recognize more and more that, you know, intervention work, street outreach work is one approach to the work um, and is really critical to the work that we're doing. But we also know that this, this investment in our communities, we need to think about job placement, we need to think about education. Uh, and really addressing some of the some of the issues that are perpetuating this level of violence. And that also means really thinking about how are we changing the structures within our communities to create more equity and opportunities for those folks that we're serving. So a major section of Lightfoot's plan uh, covers policing, calling specifically for licensing of individual police officers um, and additionally some diversity and cultural training. Uh, Vaughn Bryant, you know, do you think that's enough of a step to sort of begin to restore the, the trust that's been lost between the community and police? Oh, I mean, I think it's one step. I think, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to, to tell you guys that we launched uh, the Community Training Academy where the, the Metropolitan Peace Academy that we uh, administer trained uh, about 30 to 45 police officers today. Uh, and it was a community-led training in an effort to improve police community relations. When it comes to licensing, I think, you know, we have a lot of challenges with that, but I think it's a, a worthy cause. Like lawyers are licensed, um, clinicians are licensed. Uh, we have unions to deal with, but I think that's moving in the right direction. And I, the last thing I want to say is police have to, you know, there, there's a lot of cultural change that has to happen both from us influencing it and then from them from within as well. Uh, Vaughn, you just mentioned the Community Training Academy. What kind of uh, training are the officers getting there? So uh, they spent most of their day in circle, uh, learning about the different assets in the community. So we were in districts 9, 10, and 11 today. And, uh, you know, they were doing exercises where the community can actually get to know the police officers as people uh, and as part of the community versus uh, just police officers. So this plan also calls for um, a pi for piloting a co-responder program that would send a mental health professional um, on certain calls with uh, Chicago police. Eddie, how much of a difference do you think that could make on the ground? Honestly, Brent, I think it'll make a huge difference. Uh, and you know, I think even just introducing that has its pros and cons. Uh, but the fact that we often depend on police officers to really address some of society's needs, uh, that's not what they're hired to do, right? And so I think by doing this would allow police officers to focus more on uh, topics and issues like shootings, homicides. We have, unfortunately, have a low clearance rate, right? So being able to um, think about how do you take that time uh, and reallocate it so the officers could be focusing on really creating the public safety. And at the same time, you know, having someone else with law enforcement officers to address some of the other issues that we're seeing uh, quite often in the community. Now, that said, you know, we hear a lot of talk in the community and from activists about, you know, they say defund the police and then behind their argument, some of them say we should shift that money over. Do you, do you see, you know, some of that happening in this plan? 
Eddie? So my hope is this. My hope is that if the mayor is really um, looking at violence prevention as a, as a high priority for her, then she needs to think outside the box in the way that she's going about this work. Uh, the fact that we this year we're in a deficit in our city budget and next year as well, you know, we have to think about how do all of the departments within the, within the city's office really incorporates this idea of like violence prevention. And so while I am not in support about, you know, the way that we think about defunding, I think it really is about how do you appropriate some of those resources that are not always being efficient or uh, as we continue to do this work, are not really showing evidence of reducing violence. Having more police, all the data tells us, is not gonna increase safety in our communities, right? So this is an opportunity for street outreach, for uh, people who are doing employment services, mentoring programs, mental health services. Okay, and my thanks to Vaughn Bryan and Eddie Bocanegra. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, how the Beverly Art Walk is adjusting to the pandemic with a creative alternative. In 47 months, I've done more than you've done in 47 years. It's hard to get any word in with this clown. And the Commission on Presidential Debates announces new rules after a night of mayhem. More of our special debate coverage in Spotlight Politics. But first, some more of today's top stories. Chicago police say they are starting a series of community conversations with neighborhoods tomorrow. CPD says each of its 25 districts will host a conversation during October, starting with the 5th district in the Calumet neighborhood tomorrow, to help district commanders develop strategic plans for crime prevention and public safety strategies. We can't successfully police without understanding what the people in the community need. We have to hear directly from them. And that's the change that we hope to see moving forward, is that the community put, has some input in what we do. And Halloween's not canceled, but the state's Department of Public Health says it should look different this year. IDPH says while it's safest to stay home and plan virtual gatherings, it is giving guidance for trick-or-treating. Mostly, maintain your distance, wash your hands, and wear a mask. Trick-or-treating could now involve just setting out individually wrapped pieces of candy spaced out on a table where kids in costumes socially distanced can still pass by and retrieve it. The state also says costume masks are no substitute for cloth and medical grade masks. They recommend that if wearing a costume mask, you wear a cloth mask underneath and that you can still breathe, of course. Also, haunted houses are not allowed under phase four of the state's reopening plan. You can read more about those guidelines on our website. Meanwhile, the state confirmed more than 2,200 new cases of the virus and 35 additional deaths. The state's total case count is now more than 293,000 cases and more than 8,600 people have died from the illness. And don't forget, we have more special coverage of the first presidential debate with our Spotlight Politics team in just a few minutes. But first, Southside neighborhoods Beverly and Morgan Park are continuing a seven-year tradition of celebrating local artists with the Beverly Art Walk. This year, they're doing things a bit differently with an alternative walk or alt walk instead. Arts correspondent Angel Edo takes us to the historic neighborhood to give us a preview of some of the artwork you can expect to see on this now self-led art tour. What's typically known as the Beverly Art Walk this year is being dubbed the Beverly Alt Walk, an adjustment to the pandemic. But we still really wanted to connect with people and share art and, and try to bring the kind of bridge that isolation that we're all feeling. Now the Alt Walk is encouraging Beverly and Morgan Park residents to get out and see the public art in their neighborhoods, just like this statue behind me. Hosted by the Beverly Art Alliance, this statue is one of many pandemograms or art projects that started during the pandemic. Some decorate the sidewalks while others occupy businesses. I think it's also a good reminder that there's still beauty in this world and that people are creating beautiful things still and, and they want to share it and it gives us an opportunity to be a part of that. That's where artists Ann Blas latest project, Save Your Brain, can be found. If you notice on the bottom, they're more busy. And that was because as I was making them, I couldn't concentrate. And I, I wasn't like totally happy, but I'm like, but that's how I feel. I feel distracted. I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I can't focus. 
Once you start, I just got caught up in that, and I'm like, this is what I needed. With 20 participating businesses and 30 Chicagoland artists, the revised Alt Walk gave a mother and daughter artist duo an opportunity to work together. They created a series of portraits featuring five women from different Chicago neighborhoods titled, We're All Connected. Putting our faces on this board, it's like our face is an, a, a testament that, yeah, we're going we're gonna to uphold this message. We're going to fight for unity. We're all connected on this world. So what does it mean to be able to showcase artwork that is promoting diversity um, in a neighborhood like Beverly? Beverly is a very diverse area, but it's full of latent racism. And it was really important to me that everybody of Beverly, you know, sees these messages and takes responsibility. Looking at art is oftentimes an easier way to receive a message that might otherwise be difficult to receive. And people can look at that art and, and think about it while they're looking at it. They can take what they're getting from it away with them and think about it later. They can come back and look at it again. With businesses open for extended alt walk hours, Camp says their message is one of many she hopes residents are able to take away. And creating a space where different perspectives can be seen and heard and experienced and it enriches our lives and our community. A lot of people come to Chicago and they don't realize that there's anything further south than Hyde Park. And so part of it is wanting to just say, we're here. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. The final Beverly Alt Walk of the season is tomorrow night from 6 to 9 p.m., but the pandemograms will be up throughout the neighborhoods for the foreseeable future. And now to Paris with a very brief message for you loyal Chicago Tonight viewers. Paris. Brandis, thank you. And still ahead, we have Spotlight Politics where we'll break down last night's presidential debate as well as the Illinois House hearing looking into Speaker Michael Madigan and more. But first, we're going to take a few moments to ask for your support. Over the last several months, there's been a lot of news to keep up on, as you well know. Our coverage has spanned everything from COVID-19 and civil unrest to elections and the fair tax debate to outdoor winter dining and whether the Bears can go all the way this season. Of course they can. Chicago is a big and complex city with stories to match, and we need your help to tell those stories. During this short break, we're asking for you to become a member of WTTW and contribute to the ongoing reporting of news and public affairs programming that you value and rely on. And because the majority of our funding comes from viewers, your donation can help keep WTTW News healthy and strong. Now more than ever, fact-based news coverage is vital to our Chicago community. If you haven't already joined the WTTW family, now's the time to make an impact with your financial support. With your ongoing gift of just $5 a month or a one-time contribution of $60, you'll get access to Passport, an exclusive streaming service for members that lets you watch thousands of your favorite WTTW and PBS programs. Call 773-588-1111 or go online to WTTW com to become a member and unlock passport right now. Thank you. And with your support, WTTW can continue to provide the thought provoking programming that you appreciate. As 2020 continues to unfold, there's no shortage of current events that require us to think deeply about what's happening in our city and around the country. To increase understanding, WTTW News invites diverse voices to join in extended conversations, adding depth and context to our community discourse. For instance, our Chicago Tonight In Your Neighborhood series, it's given us a chance to explore every corner of this city and the region and to tell the stories that shape communities that often get overlooked in the news media or only get coverage when there's bad news. So, so through that series, we've introduced viewers to hundreds of community voices that make our city and our region a very special place to live. The conversations heard on Chicago Tonight offer direct, unfiltered commentary on the issues that affect us all. The perspectives we offer and the work we do are only possible with your financial support. This is a short but important membership drive, and we ask that you make your contribution now to keep independent journalism on this public television station and keep it strong. Call 773-588-1111 or go online to WTTW.com to make your pledge of support. Thank you very much. And up next, more special coverage as our Spotlight Politics team tackles the first presidential debate and much more. But first, we take a look at the weather.
Last night's presidential debate was loud, but there often wasn't much you could actually hear. People out there need help. But why didn't you do it over 20, the last 25 years? Because you weren't president. Because you weren't president screwing things up. You were a senator. You're the worst president America has ever had. Come on. Joining us to discuss that chaotic debate, plus fireworks over corruption in Springfield and the city easing COVID-19 restrictions, is our Spotlight Politics team. Welcome back, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, Carol Marine, and Paris Schutz. Um, so, Carol, we just heard you speak with Newt Minow a little bit earlier about last night, and we know that the commission is, um, they said that they're planning to change the structure of the upcoming debates. Do you think they can do something that would rein in the president? I know that they're going to try, and I believe that they're committed to that. But the problem is, even if Chris Wallace last night had had a mute button, you might have cut off a president's microphone, but he could be heard inside Mr. Biden's microphone, and the opponent is still going to hear some of that crosstalk. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be hard. And Hillary Clinton, four years ago in a town hall, where Mr. Trump was walking behind her and sort of roaming on the stage. It's going to be difficult uh, to get, I think, him to do something he doesn't want to do. Now, uh, perhaps the most notable moment last night came when moderator Chris Wallace asked Trump to condemn white supremacists and militia groups and asked them to not behave violently, as we saw in Kenosha. Here's how he responded. Sure, Are you I'm prepared willing to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, what, you, you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and, like and right boys. White supremacists and right boys. Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right his wing own, problem. This is, this is a FBI left wing. This said. is a left wing. Now, uh, Paris, the president has since claimed that he doesn't know who the Proud Boys are. Is that even plausible based on what he said in the past? Brandis, I'm deeply skeptical because this has happened so many times, too many times to be a coincidence if you include Charlottesville and other times there are uh, racially fraught situations. The president seems to say things that are ambiguous that sort of give a wink and a nod to sort of those white supremacists elements of the party and of his base and then he somewhat retracts uh, to have some plausible deniability to to say well I'm not racist and and to have to give the Republican Party some cover to appeal to the rest of the electorate that he didn't say what it seems like he said but clearly those groups like Proud Boys saw it as a tacit acknowledgement of them so I think it's happened too many times to be coincidence and it really is the president's strategy He wants to have it both ways he does not want to alienate that part of his base, but then he also wants to have plausible deniability and say, well, I didn't say anything racist. Heather, do, do you think we heard anything, anything of substance uh, during those 90 minutes? There was not a lot of substance. Um, we heard Joe Biden try to show sort of his signature empathy for families. He talked about a kitchen table where there's now an empty seat because somebody has died from the coronavirus. However, you know, he said that he was in favor of a Biden Green Deal, not the Green New Deal pushed by the Democratic Socialists of America. But we didn't really hear anything about what that would mean simply because uh, Joe Biden couldn't get in more than five words at a time and I think it was a it was a frustrating experience for me I imagine it was a frustrating experience for Chris Wallace and I imagine it was a frustrating experience for everybody who was watching although initially the the ratings show that no, that people didn't turn it off they kept watching which I gotta say surprised me a little bit <laughs> Amanda do you think this will sway many undecided voters and how many of those can there be at this point I'm not quite sure how anybody could be undecided about President Trump four years into his administration. Whether you love him or whether you despise him, I don't quite get that. I think, however, some of these undecided voters, it may not be necessarily who they favor more than one or the other, or whether they're going to bother to vote 
at all. And this debate certainly did not help, I'm sure, either people on either side of that, people who maybe aren't excited about Joe Biden or people who are looking for a reason to say, hey, I'm a Republican. I believe in some of what the president is doing, but uh, I, I'm a little put off by some of his behavior. I, this debate did not help any of that. And I think it really gets to what Heather was saying in terms of the while people seem outraged uh, that nonetheless they also didn't click it off and there is a danger in that in terms of what it means for broader democracy and just future debates it, it's sort of meant to be what some may think of as boring because they should, it well, should be wonky it and should is this be a slippery slope right you know we've, we've got I, you know two more jump, of these can I, can well, I just say Peter, sorry yeah really quickly i just want to add it, you know the, the, the attacks from the president's on uh, president on voting was extraordinary. I mean, it seems to, to be for the purpose of sowing distrust in the outcome, because if the president were actually concerned about having an election that runs fairer, then why not pledge more resources to state election authorities, or why not assure folks that state and federal prosecutors root out any instances of voter fraud, which is why you don't see widespread voter fraud. So that was an extraordinary moment late in the debate. So let's get to some state politics. Yesterday, a House investigative panel met in Springfield to look into whether House Speaker Michael Madigan took bribes from utility giant ComEd. They heard testimony from a company executive who said in an agreement with prosecutors, the company's admitted that it intended to influence Madigan. Whether it in fact influenced the speaker, whether the speaker was aware of its intent to influence, those are, those are questions that, that I don't think I'm in a position to comment on. You know, Michael Madigan, he's not ignorant of what is going on around him. He is not naive, and he is not easily surprised. Amanda, you covered this hearing yesterday. What did we learn? We learned some of the playbook, particularly Democrats, though this is a committee that has a 3-3 split, Democrats are still in charge of, frankly, both houses of the General Assembly. And so they have hold the chairmanship and really use that to squash issuing subpoenas that could force the hand of Madigan and other witnesses more compel them to come before the committee. Instead, the only witness that we had, as you just heard from, was an executive from ComEd. We did get new information from him, namely some of the individuals who are identified only by a, an initial or a number in court filings. Well, he gave us their names, also some information on some of those who received subcontracts from Commonwealth Edison that were, again, to meant to, at the very least, curry favor with Speaker Madigan. Now, this week, Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced the city is easing restrictions on bars and restaurants, and she was asked why, in light of the fact that Chicago Public School students are still learning remotely. We have to see more progress in order for us, I think, to have a conversation about in-person learning. We're not there yet. I hope that uh, we will continue. So Heather, what are the new capacity rules for bars and restaurants and how did the city decide on them? Well, uh, bars and restaurants and all indoor businesses can now operate at 40% of their capacity or no more than 50 people. That's up from a 25% capacity limit. And this is closer to what is in place in the rest of the state, which is a 50% capacity limit. I think that the mayor saw a downward trend in cases for the last month um, and said, let's turn up the dimmer switch that we've been talking about in terms of the COVID restrictions in Chicago. But I don't think we can uh, eliminate the fact that she's been an, under increasing pressure from business groups, restaurant associations, uh, business owners who are struggling to make ends meet because those capacity limits mean that they can't really serve as many customers as they would like. Uh, the, we've also talked a lot about the city's huge budget deficit. That plays a role here too, because if people aren't being served, they're not paying taxes. So it's a real pressure point. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that Chicago is still over an average of 300 cases of COVID-19 every day. Uh, when most of these restrictions were imposed back on July 20th. Chicago was averaging 233 cases per day. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, and I think that we will have to be watching very carefully whether we see another increase in cases. Carol, do you think the mayor will face pushback from parents who are frustrated that they can go out to eat, but they can't take their kids to school? 
There is that pushback already, Brandis. I mean, the mayor is going to face pushback no matter what she does. Same for the governor. And they're walking a really difficult tightrope. They've done a pretty good job uh, in Chicago and in a lot of the state in somehow keeping our positivity rate down below our neighboring states. But the pushback has been there from the beginning. It's not going away and winter is coming. This is going to be very tough. Yeah. So Mayor Lightfoot said in a virtual town hall hosted by digital news outlet The Tribe last night that negotiations with community groups on police oversight are at an impasse. Paris, you spoke with a panel of aldermen yesterday. Here's what the, the mayor's floor leader said about proposals to create a civilian oversight board. They mirror the city council, what the responsibilities are of the city council. So I think that if those are the things that uh, city council members want to want to be in charge of, then we should go ahead and, and, and do it. There's nothing prohibiting us from, from, from taking those powers via an ordinance. So Heather, what's next for police oversight? Well, that's a good question. Um, the city is under a consent decree after the Department of Justice investigation of 2017. And that decree requires the city to have a civilian oversight board, regardless of Alderman Viegas's frustration with it. So they have to come up with some form. And this week at that town hall, Mayor Lightfoot seemed to move away from the most fleshed out proposal. And she did that, but and angered two of her closest allies on the city council, Alderman Harry Osterman, and Alderman Roderick Sawyer, who have been instrumental in pushing this proposal as far as it's gotten. So it's really unclear to me sort of what plan she can come up with that could get through the city council, especially now that she's basically taken years of work from her two of her closest allies, tossed them out, along with tossing out work from a whole host of community organizations that came together in the wake of the Laquan McDonald scandal and tried to sort of chart a new path towards civilian oversight of the police department. Okay, a lot to talk about and obviously a lot more to talk about next week when I see you guys back here. My thanks to the Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, Paris Schutz, and Carol Marine. And remember, you can get more on these stories that we discussed tonight and others on our website. And we'll continue to bring you special coverage this election season, including in-depth analysis of the vice presidential debate next week. Vice presidential debate. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We go live from another stop in Chicago as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. And meet a White Sox fan obsessively illustrating every game of this historic season. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm named by elite lawyers as the top aviation firm in the country in 2020.